Welcome to Modified, episode 92. <laughs> Have you go, mate? <laughs> <I love that. laughs> what do we got, mate? What year is the car? What year? Yeah. 2014. 2014 D4D 3 litre Hilux. It's really the Hilux, one of the last ones. It's still got, it's already got the five speed auto and the big brakes on it. Steaming hot. Steaming hot. <laughs> we better wash this thing up and start Modified. Cool. Mate, should be alright, hey? I don't know how you got that so clean. You've just gone through all that mud. Yeah, I know. That is incredible. I must have gone quick enough. I think most of it came off on the way in. Mate, so you're a top sparky, you're a top car cleaner. What else can you do, mate? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I just roll with it, sort of. Well, we've got a nice clean car now. <laughs> Hino, do you want to tell us what the vehicle's set up for? Like um, long distance touring or yeah, weekend sure. warrior it's... or what is it? No, it's a touring car. Also for quick weekend getaways, but it's mainly for touring. So everything's set up to be in a way that it's easy to live out of. Not so much for hardcore forward driving, but enough to do tracks and actually get to places. But I wouldn't take it to the deepest ruts and holes was never intended for that but it's still capable enough to go through i think pretty much all the tracks as long as you don't hit the big holes there's a lot to get through especially the power set up in the back i can't wait to show that yeah there's a lot there's, there. there's some voodoo <laughs> happening back there with lack of wiring in some situations purposeful lack of wiring yeah <laughs> so we'll, we'll get to that soon I've got Brown Davies bash plates underneath there, all the way to the back. Everything that I could get on it. They were sitting a bit higher before. When I got the suspension installed, I didn't get a diff drop kit to begin with. I put it in now. There's spaces in there to actually accommodate for the bash plates together with the diff drop kit. So after that, that gap here pretty much doubled. Did you make the spaces up yourself or is it something you can get? No, they came with the diff drop kit. The CV angle before wasn't. It just wasn't right. We'll dive into more about that when we get to the suspension. Yeah, sure. Got road safe recovery points, which I think I should only ever use with the equalizer strap. They don't seem strong enough to just use a single one. The At hole seems a bit small too. Yes, that's what I thought as well. Yeah, they are. They could be bigger. Yeah. It was just something where you go like, yeah, yeah put the recovery points on as well. Look at them and go like, ah, I should have actually chosen them myself. But, you know, so far they've been going all right. I've got a VIS winch on there which I have to say for, for the price have been surprisingly good. I, I usually only use it to actually get firewood out of the forest. <laughs> I drag big giraffe stumps and trees out of the forest to have them closer to the trailer to chop them up. Yeah. And it's been doing that quite well so far. Any recoveries? Has it got any ticked off? Uh, it only recovered somebody else off a beach down south who was surprisingly well stuck on a beach axis completely 90 degree wedged in between the sand dunes and I had to winch him over the top of a sand dune uh, because I couldn't get any closer. There were massive bushes and everything in the way. Did that quite well too. So, so, so good, far it's, it's good. It's had a good workout then? Yeah, opposite lock bull bar and also opposite lock scrub bars and uh, side steps. They're not super heavy duty rock sliders or anything. I was looking at them in the beginning but you couldn't really stand on them. And since this is not one of those hardcore four-wheel drives, I wanted to be able to stand on them. We're now moving to the roof rack and we'll find out what Heiner uses it for and what's on it right now. Everyone's got a different use, let's find out. I've got a Tracklander roof rack on there. Uh, Jan and Rob fitted that for me and it's all Tracklander gear and some K-on brackets on the other side for the high lift jack and the shovel. I really only use the roof rack for recovery gear. I hardly put anything else on there. And the reason, I've even got my, my snatch straps and everything on there. The reason for that, I think that is, you can always access the roof rack if you need a recovery. 
If you can't get to the roof rack, it's probably not worth recovering the car anymore. <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> That's actually a really good point because, you know, you get those deep valleys. Yeah, exactly. You won't be able to open these up, no, will you? No. And also, I know a lot of people put them in those uh, little toolboxes ah, in the back. Yeah, yeah. You might be underwater. And yeah, you might you be might sitting like this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I always keep all my recovery gear on the roof rack. That's actually and pretty clever. That's, that's really all I use it for. We got the vehicle started so we can get some lights. Talk us through it, mate. Pella Rock Loom 380 lights on here. They were my choice because they're the most rugged lights that I could find on the market. They're derived from the Hella mining range. And at some stage, Heller decided, you know what, let's make uh, driving lights out of these work lights. And I like the way the optics are set up. You get a really good spread from the light, but you still get a focus point as well. And Heller is a company that's been producing lights forever. It's also one of the very few lights that's not made in China. These are actually made in Austria, which I quite like about the lights as well. Okay. And they got 5,000 Kelvin light color, so that they're quite easy on the eyes when you're driving for a long time. We upgrade the headlights as well? Yeah, there's a JW speaker uh, LED headlight conversion kit in there that fits quite easily with uh, the direct fit uh, option. Okay. There. They're, they're quite cool. I noticed there's no light on the roof. Is that because the bonnet's white? You don't want glare or is there something coming? I'm used, used to seeing lights up there all the time. I've been waiting for the right light bar. Okay. I've just recently found a laser lamps light bar. They've got one that's got a spread of 100 meter and 500 meter range that will snugly fit underneath there. So nice. that is ordered, so that's coming. Okay, cool. <laughs> Say again. Yeah, I'll be there. Here we go. 5152. It's talking to you. Can I get a radio check? Radio check. Mate, uh, talk us through your radios and your antenna setup. Well, I've got a GME XRS 370 radio in here that's uh, mounted uh, through the dash so I can take the handpiece off. And I've also got a Selfie Go in there with the Black Hawk aerial on the bull bar. Copy that. So the left one is the Selfie, the right hand side is your GE uh, UHF. The longer one is for the range extender for the Selfie Go, and the small one is for the UHF for the two way. Copy. What DB is your antenna? 2.1, the small aerial, and the big one is 6 to 9 dB. And how's your range? I wouldn't have a clue. Copy that. Rubber <laughs> ducky out. <laughs> it's got toolboxes on the sides and the rear and empty space in the middle. So I'm probably as curious as these guys are <laughs> as to how you use it. Because I can yeah. see you got stuff in there. Yeah, exactly right. So this is, like I said, that was my old workshop setup, and I used this type of setup because I wanted to be able to access everywhere around, but I still need to store big things like my swag and tools and table and chairs and God knows what. Sure. That's why I like the big area. It's like the dirt area. I can even throw firewood in there, whatever I want. I also like this little area here, so you can still lay things down. And then I've got water and fuel, just a spare. And to access this, I, uh, I got John from Graver Customs to put me a little ladder here and I'll put a handle in there so I can just That's cool. climb up and you can walk around everywhere here. You can just fold the solar panel out of the way. Oh, I wonder how you got under there. And I can easily get to my swag, my tools, table, chairs, all sorts of things. I usually keep my cooking gear, chainsaw and all that sort of stuff in there as well. Man, pack down for you must be pretty quick, eh? Well, you really just throw everything in. And then you put the lid on. It's a really strong magnet there. That's cool. And nothing can go anywhere. Awesome. I think it's a good way of utilizing the back because you can fill the boxes up all the way to the top. Mm. And you can fill this up all the way to the top. So you really use the whole area up under the top. Back on your fuel, you got 20 here. How much you got underneath? Uh, I've just got the standard fuel tank in there. I haven't changed that yet. So that's I probably will. Uh, 70, 75, yeah. somewhere there. Plus 20, so you're about 90, 95. Here's I've got another two Jerry's just in case I have to take more. Then I change that water out. Mm. I've got another 90 liter water tank under the tray. Oh, perfect. Uh, there's a water system attached to that as well, but I think we should get to that later. 
Yeah, we should probably get into everything now, I reckon, because these lights, there's something special going on with those. So yeah, there's as well, yeah, that's right. Let's just start opening things up. Cool, okay. Central locking. It helps. Nice. <laughs> Made for tall people. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I still admire it every time you open it. Thank you. An auto Sparky's setup. This is the the core of the vehicle. Yeah, pretty much say. is. So this is obviously is made for show. It's not it's not the easiest way to install it that way. We went to the extent of mounting everything behind the panels, which is extremely hard to put it all together because you have to pre-wire everything. There's quite a bit to it to make it happen that way. Sure. Especially with fitting all the panels inside the vehicle afterwards. But I like the finish of it, that everything's tucked away and mounted behind the scenes. We've got our Egan DC hub in there, which is obviously the, that's the core of the whole installation. That, that's the heart of it. Everything connects together. That's why we called it a DC hub. And there's a manager, 30 connected to it for the charging. I quite like the display. That's why I used one of them. Also, because I can get Bluetooth connectivity so I can see while I'm driving on an app what's going on with the charging system. We've also got an Amtron 150 amp hour lithium battery in there. Ooh, 150, yeah. cool. It just fits in sideways. Is that an awesome machine? Yeah, it is, yeah. I like gin tonic and you just can't have gin tonic without eyes. Soda water is better. Yeah. Not necessarily. Well, there's no sugar in soda water. Well, that one makes the gin tonic better because there is sugar in there. Well, what if you don't want sugar? What? What if you don't want sugar? Don't drink gin tonic. <laughs> <laughs> can plug that in. I've got an inverter here, 1,200 watt. Uh, I don't run a coffee machine or anything, so 1,200 watt works quite well. So I can just plug it in here, turn it on. I usually got that going five, six, seven, eight hours, depends on how long the night is going. That's the 300 watt panel, isn't it? That's right. That's the same one that you've got as well. Solar input. Yeah, so I can put the blanket in there. 12 watt output. Yeah, well. that's a big 50 amp outlet, just in case. You, you could run a single piston compressor off that if you wanted to, yeah, just plug yeah. it in. And then you've got the switches here. Ah, yeah. That's, uh, that's the prototype of a switching system that we're developing for Egan. So there is no cable running to this switch panel at all. It's just a box with a lithium battery in there and it's got a, a RF transmitter. Is that what's sticking out the top here? That is just a little area. Oh, yeah. yeah. So it's not going anywhere. All you need to do to install a switch panel in this car is take one of these boxes, bolt it on somewhere. Then it will take you about two minutes to program the switches and you've got an extra control panel. That so I've got one in every toolbox. <laughs> I've got one on my keypad where I can turn the lights on and off. And I got another one in the cab. So I've got five locations from which I can turn the roof lights on and off. So you can drive and turn those lights on here. Yeah, exactly. So when you go down tracks at night and you do want to see, because that's why I mounted them there. So yeah. it lights up this whole area here. So you can look out of the window and you can actually see what's happening there. You can turn the ones in the back on as well. What's the range on the, on the connectivity? Or About 15 meters, 15, 20, depends on the receivers on top of the toolboxes. So if you're standing further up, it's a bit further away. Sure. If you're closer uh, and further down, it's not as far. But I didn't want too much range on there because you got half a kilometer range and you take your key away with you and you bump it and you turn the lights on, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> so it's also quite cool when you are somewhere close by and you're swag at night, you hear funny noise and you go like, what's going on? You can just turn on the lights. You got 360 degree light all the way around the car and everything's bright. <laughs> <laughs> you all the ball off then. <laughs> Going through your rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> pretty much like that. This is pretty much my charging station. So I got a Red Rolls bag with uh, a jet boil. I get it. So you got charging station. This is how you charge yourself, yeah? Well, a bit of caffeine power. Yeah. So the only thing electric it's got in there is the milk frother. So what I usually do, I got a percolator to make some espresso, and I got a Nespresso sure. milk frother, and that will give me hot milk, and then I can just keep going. But apart from that, there's also a uh, the old boom. There's a UE boom. There's a pretty cool scan grip light. That's just my light that I mm. carry around that magnets on everything. There's a battery where I can charge things in the swag if I have to. Oh, cool. So I can just take that inside the swag. It's, it's like a power bank, pretty much. And now we're going to have a look at what's in Harness drawers. There's heaps of cables and 
There's a knockout jump start pack in there, winch controller, some spare parts. That's basically it. Pretty cramped in that one. Uh, in here, I usually pack things that I only use for the trip itself and some other stuff that I may or may not use. So that's usually half empty so I can pack things for the trip. In here, there's a tool roll. There's a soft shackle if I have to recover somebody that I don't have to get into the top here. There's medical kit, gloves, uh, rain jacket and a vest just in case it gets colder than I. Unfortunately, no contraband in the drawers this time. Heiner, there's something missing. <laughs> All right, you got that sneaky grin, what is it? The amount of stuff on this car that sun's <laughs> actually going to go down. <laughs> oh, by the way, you can get these on our website. Did you know that? Really? Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't even know. No. no. Okay, well, there you go. <laughs> oh, look at this. Oh, more. Look at it. It's, it's, it's like it's made for it. I know. It yeah. is made for it. Yeah. And you can find those on our website, fourwheelingaustralia.com. This side's complete. Okay, perfect. Move. I think that's what it's been waiting for. All right, this, I call this the services section, where you got all the things uh, in terms of services that you need, so. Like a got, machete. For example, <laughs> to settle an argument. Soda water is better. Eh, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Or firewood, of course. You got six liters of 70 degree hot water there. That's a 12 volt hot water system. That runs off the lithium battery. Okay. Takes about an hour, roughly, to heat up six liters of water to 70 degrees. Would you heat it up on your way? Usually, camp? yeah. Okay. So I've that got the switch for it. that in the cab. Yeah. So I can see when the batteries are full. Mm -hmm. And if the batteries are fully charged, you go, well, I could still keep on charging, but batteries are full. You can turn on the hot water and you charge that on the way as well. So you rock up at camp with a full battery and with a 70 hot degree hot water. And you can just, you can just have a shower in the back here straight away if you want to. Right, so for people worrying about burning themselves with 70 degree water, I'm sure there's a mixer. In here. Yeah, there is. So th this is the first ever made. This is also, that was the prototype of the water hub. The first one that we've ever made. The way this works, this is like the DC hub is a DC power distribution system. This is a water distribution system. It's pretty hard to see. It's also got an automatic water mixer in there. Uh, the way it works, you got two switches. One is for pressure from the tank that's underneath the car. The other one is so that you can uh, plug an external input in here. Mm. So you can go like that, drop it in a bucket or in the jerry can that I got there with the water. And so you can, up. yeah. So if you want to shower, you can just use any water that you find somewhere that's good enough, shower with that while the tank is stainless, food grade, and you can actually drink that water. Sure. But it is made in a way that if you want to use the external pickup, you turn the other circuit on. There's check valves in there that prevent backflow. So it's a completely separate circuit and you can't contaminate your drinking water. Well, here you only get water from the tank. It's a retractable hose reel like in Harry's. So that's your clean water? That's drinking water, yeah. And that's whatever water you can find? Yeah, whatever water you can find and you can plug in your shower. Okay. And then when you turn it on with pressure from the tank, it's set to 38 degrees now, it automatically mixes hot and cold together. You just turn that on and it automatically oh, mixes That's to 38 instant. degrees and instantly you get hot water out of it and you can have a shower. Nice. So all you have to do is, once the water is heated up, go to the back, plug that in, turn the pump on, have a shower. We use that a lot when we come from the beach. So it's enough for uh, my wife, my daughter and me to have a quick shower after the beach with hot water, jump in the car and go. Nice. Did you heat this up on the way here? Yeah, I just turned it on, because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it might be good to show it off. That's how he washed the car so quick. With hot water and detergent. <laughs> <laughs> you also got another control panel here for the lights, exactly the same one as on the other side. You can also control the <laughs> compressor with it. It's got an ARB twin piston compressor with the tank powered from the DC hub. Also, all of this here is also powered from the DC hub. And you got a hose reel for the air as well. And then oh, you yeah. got your air gun. I actually use that to clean the car. Because yeah. with the tank, when it's completely filthy, I just quickly blow the car out. It's a lot easier than vacuuming. This is cool. 
You got it works soap quite and well. everything, shampoo and whatever. Yeah. yeah. Service station. I like it. Works quite well for that. And fire extinguisher. In case the water catches on fire. Exactly. You never know. <laughs> I got some really cool lights up here, but they don't do a lot in daylight. I'll be right back. I'll go ask the sun gods to turn it off. That'll be good. Ah, thanks Ronnie. That's a lot better. You can see the light now. You struck the sun. Well, well done. I hope you can reverse it. This I call the campfire mode. This has got the same color as a campfire has. So usually it sort of goes all into each other. If the bonfire is glowing there. You just go from orange to orange. Makes for a nice night light, I think. Ah, what's happening there? Nothing. <laughs> You want a pie? Yeah. <laughs> Go forward. <laughs> Thanks, mate. Thanks for offering me my pie. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you enjoy it. Well, mm, I will. <laughs> this is the kitchen side. So this is this is usually the hangout side as well. So first thing when I arrive somewhere, you just open this up, get the fridge out. Got a chopping board built in and everything, so you can prep drinks here. That's a good part well. for the table. Yeah, it's you can actually. It's it's usually the bar. It's like within <laughs> minutes, there's there's usually drinks being made here. If you want to cook, you also got a travel buddy here with a little light to see what's going on. Pull this out. It's another little table here, and then uh, the cooker is right in here. So you can. It just takes the same cartridges as the jet boil. You can start cooking straight away. It's one of the things that I like. Rob designed this for me from PCS. The whole fit out here is all done by Rob and Jan. And I liked his idea of actually attaching this little table to the drawer. Yeah. So you can pull this out and once you set up cooking, you can still access the other drawers because I got pots and pans and stuff like that here. And over here, you got all your little other bits and pieces, your spices, things for washing up and tea bags and God knows what, all the stuff that you need in the kitchen. You're pretty much packed to go anytime then? Pretty much, yeah. There's, there's spaghetti and stuff in there. Always some snacks for my daughter just in case she gets hungry. Because that happens more often than not. Is it frozen in there? Yeah, there's pies in there now. There it is too. Yeah, there is. There should be. Oh wow. Yeah, they're pretty well done by now. <laughs> <laughs> you got another switch panel here, exactly the same one as in the other two boxes, so you can turn all the lights on and off from there as well. Are all the switches the same on all of them? Yeah, same order. Yeah. Just testing you out then. Oh, you can also <laughs> do it with the thing on my key. That's all nice. the lights in the back. Yeah. <laughs> That's just Velcro on the back, so I got some plates and stuff like that in there. Okay. This is for washing dishes and also really handy for having a shower because if you want to have a shower in the dirt, I usually take this out and I stand in it oh. so your feet don't get dirty straight away that's again. That's cool. So that usually works quite well. Multi-use. How big is the fridge? Uh, that's a 52 liter National Lunar Weekender. Now, a good thing for this is they're quite slim yeah. like that, which is what I need because I haven't got a lot of depth in here. Mm. And I still want a little bit of room behind there because there's also some stuff for when I do fire cooking, like, you know, longer... The tongs, yeah. yeah. Tongs, that one's tongs, not yeah. tongs. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> they might melt pretty quick. <laughs> and then packing it all away again. This is full of surprises. Yeah. Do you know what it's missing, Hannah? I've got a rough idea, but surprise me. There we go, mate. I might have to start collecting them. And of course, a bottle opener. I'm surprised you need a bottle opener. You're a Northern European, just like me. You don't need a bottle opener. We can open them with anything. That's true, but That's where you might it's handy right? to have that there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's for my mates, of course. Yeah. Tires and lift. We'll start with the tires. The big donuts. What have we got on here, mate? Got BF Goodridge uh, mud terrains on there. This is the second set of rims I've got on there. I went to aluminium rims. Initially, I had uh, steel rims but they kept bending. <laughs> I don't know how I did bend them all, but uh, I had to get something else on there and then I got recommended uh, the Dirty Life aluminium rims and so far they've been keeping up pretty well. Okay, so you've, you've been avoiding the hard stuff, but you're bending your rims. Well, not always. <laughs> <laughs> 
I think every time I haven't been avoiding the hard stuff, I, I managed to bend the steel rims pretty good. Yeah. Uh, was that on low tire pressure when you when you bent the rims or? The time it uh, it wasn't the time on hard pressure. I actually bent the rear rim so bad that I could only stick one finger on the top side of the rim in between the rim and the brake drum, and I could manage to put three fingers in the bottom. Wow. It, it was really bad. It was that what? bad. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty bad. Yeah. <laughs> what offset do you know? I think it's minus 15 or minus 10. Actually, can't quite remember. But it's, it's minus thereabouts. They're, they're sticking out a little bit, yeah. The size of the tires? Uh, they're 265, 70, 17. So it's about 31 and a half inch or something like that, I think. It just fits. They, they scrape a little bit in the front still. So I probably have to bend that back a little bit more. The plastic you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, the plastic, yeah. that's right. Just on, on wheel lock and then hitting something, you could just hear it scrape a little. Rapid fire, tire pressure, question, highway? 55. Wow, okay. Because of the weight in the rear? Yeah, and I've, I've experimented with it. It seems to handle best on 55, 55. Front should probably be 45, just sure. 55 anyway. Gravel roads with corrugations? 25, 30, somewhere there. Beach sand? Still experimenting. I popped off a rim before. Usually I go about 12 PSI. This, I'm still not 100% sure. Sure. That hill over there that we just came down from and you washed your car? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it would usually do about 28 on that one. Two inch lift in the front and the back. It's from Outback Armor. It's the top of the range one where you can uh, adjust the rate of the shockies. A rebound compression? No, nah, just one combined setting. Okay. Both would be better. The upper control arms changed, but I got that done afterwards because I felt that the front wasn't handling the way I wanted it. Mm -hmm. And with changing the upper control arms, that changed a lot. So I, I can really recommend that. I also got a diff drop kit installed because my CV angles were way too steep. Even at two and a half inch? At my liking, they were way too okay. steep. So now they are back to, I think, sure. where they should be. So in the back, uh, uh, also Outback Armor all the way through. The kit comes with little brackets and everything uh, to relocate uh, the brake lines and all that sort of stuff. It's a complete kit for the car, which I really liked. And you said two and a half in the rear as well as the front? Two, two and a half, somewhere there, I sure. think. I didn't really measure, I just went for it. And uh, it's 350 kilogram constant load rating in the back, which works quite well. I was thinking about airbags before, but it doesn't seem to need it. Even if I got full water and everything on board, it still sits exactly the way I want it to. Sure. That way it ha uh, handles quite well too. And another thing I liked about the suspension was that they had extended bump stops, front and back. So if you really smash through something, the bump stops can actually take some of the force as well. Under Z bonnet. Under Z bonnet. Things that you can't see. There's a three inch torqued exhaust system underneath there from the turbo back. It's also Dino Tune uh, that AMV did. And they also did an intake manifold clean because it was pretty filthy. I did that after about 170,000 Ks or something. I did see some pictures, it was quite shocking okay. how restricted it was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And it went a lot better afterwards. Uh, I also changed out the battery to a Sentry Dual Force battery to have a bit more reserve capacity in the battery. And also uh, bigger cranking amps to run the winch. And just in case I leave the lights on for a little bit, I don't have to worry about the battery being flat straight away. Just a question. You being an auto sparky and a very knowledgeable one, to say the least, yeah. You've only got one battery in the front. Do you want to explain to the audience why you've gone that way? I've got my secondary battery in the back that's running all my, I call it house electrics, all the stuff that I want to use when I'm actually stationary. Nothing runs off this battery. So as soon as I turn the key off, unless I leave my headlights on, nothing in the car runs off this battery. So I'm quite happy to just use one battery and a jump start pack. And just in case, uh, I need to jump start myself. I just grab the jump start pack and jump start myself. That way. It only comes short in one thing. If you do your alternator out bush somewhere and it stops charging, you don't have two batteries to drive home on, but yeah. I can repair alternator in the bush. So if push comes to shove, I can drive, wait a day 
<laughs> charge it up with the solar blanket <laughs> yes. and drive again. Yeah, got enough water for that. I've also got an upgraded alternator. I put a 150 amp alternator in there, one that is made for underground mining. It's not a sealed unit, but it's electro coated, so it's a lot uh, harder wearing over sure. time. It doesn't corrode as easy. And then I relocated the power to a fuse arrangement here. So I've got the alternator coming in. And from here, I'll feed the Egan DC hub. I feed the Anderson plug in the back of the car. And I also feed an accessory fuse box that I put in from a 70 series Land Cruiser. I was going to say that looks familiar. Yeah, it does. It comes <laughs> out of a 70, <laughs> 70 series. series. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I use that for my lights and everything, extra horns and so on and so forth, because I really don't like clutter on the battery terminals. I like to keep them as clean as possible. Then I've also got one big cable running back from this fuse arrangement to the battery. And that's uh, how the alternator feeds the car. Idea of that is I'm supplying the DC-DC chargers first, also for my camper trailer. And after that, the battery and from here, the rest of the car, because the DC-DC chargers are the ones that are most prone to voltage drops, mm -hmm. while the rest of the car, the dash, doesn't care if it's 13 volts, or if it's 12.8, uh, 12.5, sure. 12 12 that mm. doesn't really matter. You got a catch can over here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that, like, after you got the intake clean, you obviously, is yeah. That, is that when you did that, or? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Sure. So that was all in one step. Also, uh, the diff breathers and gearbox transfer case breathers, they are plumbed into the air box over there. Then I've got a Safari Air Max snorkel, where you're standing. Some hella super tone horns here to make a lot of noise if I have to. <laughs> <laughs> I use one of these uh, battery switches. You can just shove them back and forth as a winch isolator. They work quite well. I thought they might get hot, but I, I really tested them. I did run the winch for almost five minutes flat out until the winch overheated. Sure. And that was still okay. I've never seen one of those before. Well, you just push them in so they're off like that. And then you push them in and it just pushes two big contacts on top of each other. Okay. Really simple and really easy way of getting a winch isolator, just in case you haven't got extra room to put one of these big battery isolators in. Interesting, okay. Over here, I got a reverse camera for when I've got my camper trailer on there. So that's, uh, that's wireless. And as soon as I got the trailer on and it plugs into the Anderson plug, the wireless uh, transceiver in the back turns on and I can turn the camera screen on and I can see what's happening behind me. Ah, oh, so you can switch it to, back, to the back out of the trailer when you hook the trailer up? Yeah, to the back of the trailer. Oh, so okay. I can still see what's happening really behind me and when I'm okay. backing up with the trailer and stuff like cool. that. I changed the stereo to a Kenwood unit. It's got a focal split system in the front and Blaupunkt subwoofer under the seat. Your usual switches and stuff like that. Still some remains for when I bought the car, somebody put a real crappy switch in there and glued it in. <laughs> <laughs> Must have been good so I can't take somewhere. it out. Uh, but what's going to happen is uh, I'll take that out and get a new panel once I get the light bar, because then I need that switch spot for something. HEMA navigator here, also on a ram mount. That's cool. I like, I like the position of it. So your passenger can have a look to it. Yeah, you can just, yeah. if you've got a passenger, you can just swivel it around and then Sure. That person can be the navigator. Also got a two-way here, that's the XRS370. And I used the little spot in the dash here where you usually got your USB and your auxiliary input. I got rid of that because I've got that on the side of the stereo now. And I've got that so I can connect and disconnect my UHF through there. The SAS S-Drive throttle controller in there. I thought after I got the uh, engine tune-up done, it was cool to adjust exactly how I wanted the throttle to respond because mm -hmm. you can change the settings very well in there to actually tune it exactly the way you want it to behave. I never change it. I've just, I found my setting and switch for the rear diff locker here. So I put an Eaton Harrop electric diff locker in the back to have a bit more traction when I need it. There's also charging ports. So I've got a uh, powered from the battery in the back. I've got a cigarette lighter socket port there, twin USBs and then more outlets in the back just oh, in for case passengers. I wanna, yeah for passengers or if i want to take a freezer sometimes i chuck a 50 liter freezer in the back if i go a bit further mm. and then i can run that off the battery in the back as well what else have we got msa seat covers and you got your switches here yeah that's right 
Well, so they are the yeah. switches for the lights. So that's a little control panel that's where cool. I can turn the lights and the mm. compressor and everything on. The way you don't have the switches on your dash, it's just here. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, and under the seat, I've got also the self I go unit mounted in there. And then a really good spot, just in case people are wondering, because with the self I go system, it's important to have good antenna separation. So I always put the internal aerial, the one that sends out the amplified signal, I always put that underneath the center console here. Then you get awesome antenna separation. Q&A. Here we are, freezing our balls. Yeah, fire would be nice. <laughs> yeah, it would be. We should have brought the bloody swags and just camped here. Yeah, would have been all right. In darkness we film. <laughs> all righty then. Why did you choose a Hilux as a four-wheel drive? Initially, I chose it as a workshop car. And I would have gone for a 70 series if I could have gotten one with an automatic gearbox in it because I did really like the 70 series and I had a Troopy before, but I wanted an automatic gearbox. And that's why I ended up with a Hilux, because I think it does almost the same as a 70 series. It's a bit more comfortable to drive. I can still pack a lot of stuff. And I wanted a Toyota. I looked at other cars before and I did test drive them and I hated every one of them. And then I did sit in a Hilux and it just felt home. After having a 70 series and an 80 series and then a Hilux, Toyota just felt right when I drove it. I looked for a very long time to find the right one because I wanted an SR model with the vinyl in it and I also wanted a 2014 plus model because I wanted a five-speed auto gearbox. I didn't want a four-speed again. I had that in the 80 and that annoyed the crap out of me. So there was only a really small range of vehicles. I think they only made them for one and a half years where they had that upgraded model with the five-speed gearbox, the bigger brakes on it, and I wanted a tray in the back. I didn't want a tub. You had an 80 series. Yeah. You've had a Troopy. That's right, yeah. And now you've got a Hilux. What else have you had? Uh, MQ Patrol from 1980. So you've gone through a few four-wheel drives then? Yeah. And Verena had a GQ from 88. I tested that one as well. So yeah, yeah, a few. I understand you've been on a Holland track Numerous times, perhaps, mm. in WA? Yeah, that's right. Where else have you taken a vehicle, that, like a highlight trip for yourself? Uh, I did uh, the Gibb River Road. I did drive all the way down from Broome to Perth. Uh, I did zigzag across uh, outback Queensland, New South Wales, and T a fair bit. That was, that was when I came over to Australia first, Verena and I. We drove around for about two and a half years lift a bit here and there. That's when we lift out of the patrols and in the end out of the troopy. And then we eventually came over here, stayed here, but we've always been going out forward driving. We do like the bush uh, and the outback, but also down south, uh, a lot in the Kerry forest. I really like it down south in the Kerry forest. What's the best thing and the worst thing about your Hilux as it is? The ease of use is the best thing about it. It's so easy to actually stop somewhere and make something to eat, fix a drink. It's like everything's accessible. All the services are there. You can have a shower, you can wash something. Everything's there. That is really cool. Uh, the worst thing about it, I have to think about that one because I like, I think pretty much everything about it. Not having radar crews. Radar crews would be a nice thing. <laughs> <laughs> just after you mentioned that before a bit more ground clearance as well because with the Hilux in the beginning I was torn in between going two ways I, I was either thinking about do I go 31s and 2 inch lift or do I go a full 4 inch lift and put 33s on it and diff lock the front and the back and make it a lot more heavy duty off road but then I knew I would pay with it by handling on long trips. Hmm. So I think if I could have the same setup, but even more off-road capable, that would be cool. But at the moment it's hard because then I lose that drivability on the road, in my opinion. That's what happened with all the other four-wheel drives that I had. Sure, been there, done that. Yeah. <laughs> you traveled around a fair bit and you've now set yourself up pretty well here in Perth, yeah. Klarman Automotive Solutions and Perth Pro. 
So if you want to just tell us about the business, give yourself a plug. Sure, and then sure. We'll move on to your best advice. Cool. Klamon Automotive Solutions, we're trying to build the coolest and the best setups. What pretty much started as a hobby. And I never really planned to make it into a business, but I think because I've been doing and we've been doing what we've been doing, it turned out that people were just really loving that we put our passion into it. And I think with with the background of knowing what works and what doesn't work, just for myself when I go camping, I think I get the right idea for a lot of people. And so that's what we try to put into the Klarman business to actually build really cool setups for people. And then after we did that for a while, I realized that I need spare parts all the time. I need to have parts available. And that's when the Perth Pro idea started. And we didn't want to make it the same business name uh, because we thought we have one business for the installations and the other business for the parts side of things because we can push it in a bit different ways. Started as a warehouse and then we had the idea well if we have a warehouse we might as well get people in there that can buy the same stuff that we are actually using for our installs. Where That's why we called it Perth Pro because we can get people the same parts that we use for our installs. So the same parts that the professionals use for their installations. That's where the Perth Pro idea came from. And that's what you can do now. Perth Pro pretty much works as a shop that is there. Workshop is on that side where we come in to grab all the things out of our warehouse and customers can walk in from the other side and buy the exact same things that we use for our installs in the workshop. Plus they get some good advice from our sales team in there, what works and what doesn't work for their setups. Hana, let's go to your ultimate advice for someone who's going to do auto electrics to the vehicle. Yeah. Your one bit of advice. Use a fuse. <laughs> <laughs> For everything that you do, within 30 centimeters of a battery, there should be a fuse. If you, if you stick to that and you get the fuse rating right, and there are tables on the internet that tell you what is the right fuse rating for that type of cable, you cannot set your car on fire. If you don't put a fuse in somewhere, you sooner or later set your car on fire. I tried it myself and I did set my car on fire. So as my advice, <laughs> Don't do what I did when I was a young apprentice, use a fuse. Even if you haven't got one, don't connect it, go somewhere, get a fuse, and then install whatever you want to install to your car. I like it. Cheers, Hana. Cool. Thanks, mate. That thanks was good. For, thanks for bringing the car. Do you, do you have a heater? <laughs> no. <Need> a heater. <laughs> In the camp, I've got a diesel heater. <laughs> All right, guys, that was another episode of Modified. I hope you enjoyed it. Now, when will the next episode be? Will it be in the light or in the dark? Who knows? With my track record, who knows? See you next time.